this just to try and make it a bit more interactive. Um, I should say that um, a lot of the data you're going to see is part of or comes from our digital news report, which is the largest ongoing news survey in the world. You can see here um, 40 markets we covered last year, 80,000 respondents, and um, it's based on an online poll. So we ask representative 2000 people roughly in each country, a whole load of questions every year. And you can see some of the countries that we cover here it includes the Netherlands. And uh, we have a polling agency called YouGov that collects the data on our behalf. And then we do a lot of the analysis. So one of the advantages of doing this survey every year and asking the same questions every year is you can really get a good sense of how news consumption has changed, um, the structural changes that have really shaped the industry. Um, and this just shows you uh, how people have been receiving news in the United States, for example, so just one uh, country example uh, since 2013. So you can see the top line is basically online. So it hasn't actually increased. It's just, you know, three quarters of people are using online for news every week. Uh, what's interesting is that television has actually become less important over time. That's the orange one. Increasingly, uh, that that's younger people not uh, consuming television news in the way they used to. Um, you can see there also that there is sort of some events that happen, such as the election of Donald Trump in 2016. You can see how that really increased interest in news. But generally, what you're seeing here is structural change. And then you've got uh, people stopping uh, reading newspapers. So at the beginning, 2013, uh, about half of people in the US were reading a newspaper every week. That's down to 20%. And in the same period, you see this extraordinary rise in social media for news specifically. So about a quarter and now about a half are using it. Um, so these are sort of structural changes. We see this in most countries, including the Netherlands, this is the UK. Again, a similar picture. You can see how television generally has become less important over time social media become more important. And again, print going down very significantly. Uh, broadly, the same trends. Uh, we tend to use social media a little bit less than, than they do in the US. Um, those are averages. And what's really interesting is to see the generational splits. So preferences, when you ask people what their main source of news is, you see this, uh, this very different picture between older people and younger people. So on the right, the dark color on the right, 43% of over 55 say television is still their main source of news in the UK, but only 8% of 18 to 24s. So you can see that massive gap, whereas on the left-hand side there, you've got online media, 84% of, under, of uh, 18 to 24s say that's their main source of news. And within that, uh, four in 10, now say that social media is their main form of news. Four in 10, 18, 24 say social media is their main source of news. Uh, I consider this to be uh, slightly worrying. You, you may just consider it to be how life is these days. Um, so, so there's this massive sort of generational split in the formats that people use, the way in which people gather news, this, uh, and, and that sort of, uh, I think, is, is, is a really sort of key fact that's often missed when you look at the averages. If you look at um, devices, the other big change within online has been the devices that we use. So again, 2013, people were mainly accessing via fixed computers, desktops or laptops. Increasingly, it's these very powerful personal mobile devices that you have in your pocket. Uh, in the UK, it's gone from 29% to 62% who say that they're accessing news weekly via a smartphone. So it overtook um, the laptop in about 2017. Uh, the tablet is there and then you can see smart speakers. And this is kind of important because it has really significant implications for uh, the type of news that works. You know, sort of 800 word text article doesn't really work so well on a mobile phone. And it's kind of encouraged the use of social media and more visual formats for, for telling news as well. So it's often underestimated the importance of the smartphone. Okay, I'm going to try my first poll now. <laughs> so I want to get a, um, uh, do a quick poll to understand where you get your news. And specifically, today, where did you get your first news? So where did you get the first con conflict with news? So uh, if we can just launch the poll, 
So if you just fill that in, it's television, radio, printed newspaper, smartphone, computer, or smart speaker. If you just click one of those. Um, I have just checked a poll. I've realized it has been created with all three questions in one poll. So this just refers to the first question. So feel free to only fill out that one. I'm creating the other polls just now. Um, so the only the first question is relevant. Okay, it actually is allowing you to do more than one, but just fill in one. It's your first one. <laughs> Or um, if you can't submit it without just filling in one, um, fill in the other ones for now. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, let's I'll just send them again when we come. Maybe I'll. I'll no, no. Let's let's through. let's do them all now. And, <laughs> all right. And that's probably going to be easiest. Okay, we'll just do them all now. So, which was the first place you come across news today? And then, if you scroll up, thinking about how you got news online, did you commit? How how did you? So, when you were online. Did you come across it first via a lock screen, via social media, via email, or did you go to a news website, um, or did you use an aggregator app? So how did you get that news? And then the third question is, which of the of the social networks did you use for news in the last week? So it's a slightly different question. In the last week, just and this you can tick the various ones that you used. So you've got more. So for the first two, just tick one. And then once you've done all those, then submit. I'm very excited to see these results. How are we doing? I think almost everyone has voted. It's saying 23 out of 25 for me have voted. Okay. Let's reveal the answers then. Can we show the answers? Can you not see the answers? I can't. I think if okay, everybody well, then I voted, then they'll be visible, I believe. Oh, wait, I... That's it. Yeah, you just have to, to click go. that extra button. Okay. <laughs> right, so what have we got? We got smartphone. Uh, so, so, so most of you got your first news from smartphone. A few people are traditional. They like to turn on the radio. Maybe you wake up with a radio alarm or something like that. Um, printed newspaper, that's interesting. <laughs> so one or two people with, uh, picking up their first news from a printed newspaper. And then within online, so most people are doing it online, uh, then most people are getting it from the lock screen and from social media. Um, uh, a news website. So a lot of you are actually going directly to a news website as the first thing you do. Uh, and then the, the networks that you're using uh, for news specifically. So these are very high figures in terms of you're obviously using a lot of um, different networks, but you're also using a lot of these networks for news. So four in 10 say that they're using Instagram for news, WhatsApp, Twitter. So you're obviously using multiple networks there. And then just a few people using TikTok and LinkedIn and Messenger as well. Uh, so this is this is interesting. I'm just going to close that. Uh, let's just compare it with, uh, with a representative sample of people. So um, first news of the day in the UK, around a quarter, so they get their first use on a smartphone. It's now the number one. So I think your figure was whatever it was, 60, 60, 70 percent. Uh, so younger people much more likely. Um, but one of on average, uh, a lot of the older people are still basically getting it from television um, or from the radio. But that has changed significantly. And then they go for under 35, 54 percent. So you're not far off that in terms of first news of the day. Um, and the smartphone uh, just this is just another illustration of, of what's changed is if you were if you travel around the London underground a few years ago you would this would be a typical scene so uh, this was a time when you opened your newspaper it was a time when you concentrated on one thing getting up to date in the morning uh, on your way to work what does that look like today it looks more like that and it, I mean, what are people doing on those screens? Uh, so some people are listening, some people are playing games, maybe they're listening to watching last night's television, 
So the competition for journalism and for taking in difficult information is much tougher. It's much harder to grab or attract quality uh, attention. And again, we, uh, it's really interesting with sort of younger people. Uh, we did a study a couple of years ago where we put a tracker on people's phones with their permission. Uh, these are all under 35s. And we asked them, we basically measured which apps they were using and uh, how much time they spent with different apps. And what you see here is basically the order of those things. So number one is Instagram. Everyone we talked to had Instagram and they spent the most amount of time on Instagram then Facebook, then Snapchat and WhatsApp. So you can you, you get the idea. Basically, people are spending the majority of their time on these communication apps. Uh, some people are spending time with Netflix or with podcasts, and obviously that, that can be significant amounts of time. Uh, with Twitter, YouTube, uh, I'm sure you recognize a lot of this. The question is, where is the news? You know, if you're spending time on all of these, these uh, you know, are people actually consuming news? We did find some news apps. So some of the young people we talked to were using the BBC News app or CNN or Apple News, but they weren't spending much time there. So on average, you know, one to two percent of their time was spent with news specifically, as opposed to sort of coming across news within these distributed environments. So that's obviously a, just a massive change in terms of how uh, people used to receive news by sitting down, you know, often as a family watching the television news. OK, so so these are very big changes. Um, and they've sort of weakened the power of traditional gatekeepers like mainstream media. Uh, they've also increased the power and the role of those giant tech platforms like Facebook and Google. Uh, and then on top of that, we've had this sort of global pandemic, which has thrown everything up in the air again in these very unpredictable ways. Um, it's interesting just to look at what's actually happened uh, over the last year. One of the things we've seen in Europe generally is this very significant increase in the use of television news, even with younger people, uh, because people are sort of locked up in their homes, often with their family that got television on anyway. Um, initially, it was up 16 percentage points in the in the UK, uh, but in many European countries, up you know the bulletins originally were up about 30 percent. They've gone down since. Uh, we asked questions in a number of different countries uh, about their usage in between January and April last year. And broadly, we see the same thing. So in every country, television is up, online is up a bit, social media is up hugely, and print is the one that's fallen. So print newspapers have really uh, suffered enormously with coronavirus, and many of them are not going to survive. The other thing that's really changed is whole new sort of digital habits. So it's transformed the way in which you study, for example, at university, it's transformed the way journalists work. So you know, they're interviewing people using Zoom and having to use online remote tools uh, to do their work. Uh, you've also had ordinary people learning things like WhatsApp groups or Facebook groups, older people who previously wouldn't have done. So a lot of people have been kind of forced to really embrace digital. And I think that's going to have a really lasting impact uh, in sort of the way we think, the way we shop, the way we communicate over the next few years. Um, for the news industry, there's this kind of paradox in that it's um, reminded people of the of, of the value of quality journalism on the one hand. So there's more demand. So generally, more people are using news, more people are worried so that they're checking the news more often. On the other hand, there's sort of less money to pay for it. And some publishers are reporting that their revenues have gone down, you know, advertising revenues, maybe 30, 50 percent. The print revenues have gone down. Um, and so that has led to, um, you know, all these casualties. So it's a sort of story of layoffs, consolidation, restructuring. Um, you know, uh, a news provider like BuzzFeed, for example, has closed down its operations in the UK and many other parts of the world. So if you put all this together on the business side, what we're seeing is a sort of realization that digital advertising alone is not going to sustain quality journalism, a big range of journalism that sort of supports democracy. And um, people are quite worried about that and they're trying to find alternative models. And so we've been seeing for a few years, the shift towards asking people to pay for content or at least a sort of a, a mix 
of models. Uh, so how many people are paying for news around the world? So um, we ask this question in our digital news report, are you paying for a digital subscription online? And broadly we find uh, that there, are, there have been some increases in the last year or so. So in the US it went up from 16% to 20%. Um, in a country like Norway, you actually have four in 10, around 42% who say they pay for at least one online subscription. Um, in the Netherlands, it's around 15, uh, 14%. But in other countries like the UK, it's only around 7%. It's much lower. Um, there's lots of kind of reasons for that. Um, but um, what are people subscribing to? Um, what we generally find is there's a few very big national brands who are taking the most value out of this. So in the UK, it tends to be the Times and the Telegraph, sort of two quality newspapers that are charging for news in the US, New York Times, Washington Post, um, taking the lion's share of all the subscription. Uh, in Norway, it's slightly different because local newspapers is incredibly important. It's actually quite important in the Netherlands as well. Um, and um, I think we had about 130 different local titles mentioned in our research. Um, but in the UK, just a handful of local news providers are charging for news or people are subscribing to it. Um, what The other thing we're seeing is sort of a different model where in the wake of coronavirus, a lot of news organisations are saying, uh, will you please give us some money? Will you give us a donation? Will you help us with uh, maybe membership models? So you have uh, Vox Media in, in the US, for example, which you know relied mainly on advertising and events and podcasts advertising is now asking people to subscribe directly because they say we're producing a lot of quality journalism please will you support us the guardian in the uk is, is probably the best known contributor model they now have about a million people who are subscribing <clears throat> or contributing money <clears throat> and that's increased by about fifty thousand during covid 19 so we you know a lot of these news providers have got an increase in membership donation or subscription uh, during COVID. Um, so if if the business models are going to move to direct reader payment, which they are, you probably notice you go around the internet that you get more of these annoying pop-ups saying you can't, you know, you've read your articles, you can't read this title anymore. We're going to see more of that. Um, then the issue of trust is going to be critical because otherwise people won't pay for these providers. And what we've seen in our data and other people see the same is that trust in the media has been falling significantly over, over many years, not in every country, but in, in many countries. So on average across the 40 countries or so we do, 38% uh, say they trust most news most of the time. So the rest either don't or are neutral about it. And that's gone down by four percentage points in the last year. Uh, only four, just you know, under half say they trust the news they personally use, which is a bit of indictment. Um, and then even fewer people trust the news that they find in search or in social media. Uh, just you know, these environments are a bit more unpredictable. You're not quite sure what you're seeing there, or it's harder to distinguish what's true and what isn't true. Um, if you look at the uh, ranking chart, um, what you see is quite a variation here. So on the one hand, on the left, you see Finland, traditionally the most trusted media environment, 56%, uh, so only just over half, but even so. And then right on the other side, uh, we have South Korea and France with under a quarter who say they trust most media most of the time. Um, some of this is kind of, it's linked to political upheaval. So you can see in Hong Kong, we've had all those protests people are much less trusting of the media because there's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, in the UK, we have one of the biggest falls uh, and there's sort of huge divisiveness over Brexit and that's fed through to how people feel about the media and the messages that they're telling because people feel really strongly about this polarizing issue and they don't necessarily like all the views that are being uh, expressed within the media. Uh, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, the Netherlands actually is one of the most trusted news environments um, but of course there's a huge variation between uh, you know the NOS on the one hand and uh, some of the sort of more partisan media uh, on the other hand and uh, it's really interesting looking at um, 
the political dimension of this. So in the US, I think the average trust scores are about 30 something. But look at the difference between people who self-identify as being liberal. So that's the red line at the top. So trust there is much higher. So in 2019, it was over half. So they trusted the media. These are liberals basically saying we trust the New York Times or the Washington Post to hold Donald Trump to account. And then on the other hand, uh, only 9% of people on the right said they trusted the news media. And that uh, that's obviously fueled by Donald Trump saying, you know, it's fake news media and all the rest of it. But it gives you a sense of the problems that you face in the US and this sort of alternative media ecosystem that's grown up as a, as a result and why people don't trust the media, uh, you know, leading through to the, the examples that we looked at. Uh, if you look at the individual scores, these are quite low compared with the Netherlands, but uh, you can see the traditional network news is, is still reasonably trusted. Um, but look at sort of CNN and Fox, um, you know, incredibly divisive. You have as many people who say they don't trust those two networks as do trust them. And if you look at their political allegiances, it's all people on the right who say they don't trust CNN and people on the left who say they don't trust Fox. So these are people, basically, these are broadcasters who are broadcasting partisan messages to that sort of core base. Uh, do we want that kind of news in, in, in Europe? Um, it's increasingly a trend. So we're having a couple of partisan news providers, television providers who are going to start broadcasting in the UK uh, later this year that have, you know, trying to take some of the lessons of Fox and CNN and bring them to the UK, uh, which is slightly worrying. So um, just moving on to um, misinformation. And overall, we find that more than half say that they can't, they're worried that they, they can tell the difference or can't tell the difference between what's true and what's fake on the internet. Um, and that figures, you know, remains stubbornly high. What are they concerned about most? So this year we asked them, you know, is it, is it Russians or is it, uh, you know, your national politicians or is it journalists who you think are selling you misinformation? And overall, this is sort of averaged across countries, most people blame their national politicians. So, you know, they think it's essentially politicians either directly via their social media feeds or in the media who are telling lies and pushing misinformation, often amplified by social networks or journalists or whatever. Uh, some people are concerned that it's actually journalists that, that are, and, and some people are concerned about ordinary people fueling this through sort of sharing unreliable information, et cetera. But again, you can see here how the, how the, the politics plays into this. So in the US, the proportion that says domestic politicians are most to blame, if you are a liberal, then uh, that's much higher. So 49% half of liberals say that the politicians are to blame. But if you're if you're on the right, you think journalists are to blame. Again, that's fueled by that narrative about the fake news media. Forty three percent think that it's the journalists. It's the it's the Washington Post and, and the New York Times and CNN and MSNBC that's to blame. In the UK, it's a slightly different picture. But again, you can see how that left right split really, really um, matters in terms of who you blame for misinformation. Um, I think people also blame the messenger, um, so they blame social media, but which which network should we most, be most concerned about? Um, these are the most used social networks for any purpose. We saw your data uh, just earlier on. So about six in 10 said they're using Facebook for any purpose. That hasn't really changed very much over the period. This is average of 14 countries. Uh, so you know it will be slightly different in, in different countries. YouTube just behind that for any purpose. But look at the next one, that the, the WhatsApp line has gone from 17% to 48% on average. So this sort of huge growth in, so not just open social networks, but more closed social networks. Uh, and Facebook Messenger has also benefited from that. But I think the other really interesting one is the rise of Instagram for any purpose. Again, you can see from 8% to 36%, Snapchat 5% to 13%. So this is kind of the rise of some of these mobile first, more visual social networks. And this is the real trend that we've seen. People think social media hasn't changed. It's constantly changing. 
and from this year we'll certainly have TikTok on that chart as well. Uh, in terms of news, um, so sounds from the data that you gave me earlier that you're using these networks much more for news than other people. I think it was like 60% of you said you use Facebook for news. Uh, on average across uh, all demographics, about 36%. Again, you can see uh, WhatsApp becoming much more important. Uh, Twitter growing a little bit again, but again, Instagram is the biggest mover in the last uh, few years. Um, and I think the, uh, you know, the, the other question as more people are using these networks for news is, is and the consequences are becoming clearer for society is what the platforms do about this. And it's becoming uh, a real issue, not just in the United States, but elsewhere as well. You know, they are coming under more pressure to police misinformation to take down content that is damaging or harmful. And if they're not, uh, legislation is being introduced in many European countries, including Germany, to um, put punitive fines on them if they don't uh, take down misinformation. Now that's kind of one thing if you're talking about real extremists, but if it, you're talking about the president of the United States, this is a really big step. And so what we've seen the last year with coronavirus in particular is, the platform's getting much, much tougher at taking down some of this information, trying to clean up um, and promote more reliable sources, whether that's about coronavirus or whether it's traditional news that's been through checking. Uh, sort of some would argue finally uh, facing up to some of their responsibilities. And here they are socially distancing from, from Donald Trump, so banning uh, him, if you like, from Twitter and from Facebook. Uh, you have far right. Um, uh, social networks like Parler being booted off by the tech platforms. And then other people, of course, just say, uh, you're censoring us. This, and, and so in many parts of the world where people are concerned about free speech, they don't want governments to make rules about who they like and don't like because they'll make different choices. So I think this is very much um, you know, uh, a, a, a turning point uh, and it's gonna be really interesting to see how it works out. I think this year we're going to see uh, a real sort of tussle over, over this. You know, people are really worried about the effect of social media on society, on democracy, partly because of what's happening in the US. This, is, of course, has been happening elsewhere for a long time. Um, but people can't really agree on how to regulate free speech. It's such a difficult issue. And we're already seeing governments looking at what's happening in the States and then trying to use that to clamp down on people they don't like. Uh, even in liberal democracies, we're seeing a sort of rush to, to, to regulation in the UK, for example, we're going to have a, a law this year about content that is not just illegal, but is harmful and uh, sort of regulation, more regulation of these big tech platforms. So it's going to be really interesting to see what happens there, as well as efforts to try and cut off some of the funding um, to those sites that are making money off essentially misinformation, uh, which continues. And um, I think more will be done about that this year. So um, just finally, um, you know, the power of platforms is a, is a huge problem for, for media. I just wanted to finish by talking about a few things that the, the media is trying to do in response. I mean, one of the things they're trying to do is be better, to focus more on uh, creating better journalism that really engages people more deeply, but also doesn't necessarily chase sort of sensationalism um, or clickbait or all the reasons why, all the other reasons why media has become less trusted over the last few years. And they're also trying to sort of build direct relationships in social media, but also on their, their own websites. A couple of things that I think are interesting. So one is um, uh, email was one of the, the original uh, digital communication it was, you know, still is huge, but less with younger people, but it's really sort of having a revival. It's a very simple technology that allows you to build those direct relationships. And we're seeing, you know, 20% in some countries getting news by email every day. So this idea of a sort of a briefing, uh, you had a lot of emails around coronavirus, sort of pop-up emails, just give me five things, tell me everything I need to know in a really sort of concise, easy way. Often these are also curated by 
individual journalists. So, you know, it used to be you had a whole load of links. Now, increasingly, this is curated by somebody you trust and know, and they kind of talk you through, I guess it's bringing personality to digital, which is one of the things that's been missing, um, certainly in traditional news. And sort of closely related to that, I think, is the idea of sort of news podcasts. So when podcasts started, there weren't really any news podcasts because it took you about a day to download anything. So it would all be out of date. Um, but now, um, you know, these, these are becoming incredibly popular and actually uh, very strong year on year growth. About 30% are using podcasts regularly now across countries. And these are these have been huge hits during the lockdown. So coronavirus uh, pop up podcasts. Um, the second one is an epidemiologist, often hosted by you know scientists. The second one, Christian Dresden, is a German epidemiologist who also advised Chancellor Merkel. So when you were listening to the podcast, you were getting the same information that the Chancellor was getting, and that sense of intimacy, but also expertise, and the uh, the audio medium really connects, and particularly connects with young people. So there's there's a sort of sense that people under 35 never really focus on anything for very long. And, you know, uh, unlike people of my generation who used to really sit down and take things in in great depth. Um, but I think, you know, it's really interesting. On average, people are listening to these podcasts for 20, 30 minutes and uh, they're disproportionately popular with, with, with younger people as well. Uh, so I think, um, I think audio is such an interesting medium because, uh, you know, digital generally, the web is great for attracting people's attention and flitting between this and that and keeping uh, memes and, but actually for really sort of understanding something, audio is uh, a great medium and video is also great in lots of different ways. And I think we're going to see the internet really develop into more of a multimedia thing. We are already seeing that. Um, and audio is just interesting because, you know, there's so many things that are pushing audio in new directions so you've got whole sort of better headphones platforms that um, enable you not just to listen but often to control what you're listening to uh, the sound quality is becoming a lot better uh, there's less friction in it uh, you've got smart speakers as well you've got um, on-demand audio coming to cars so i think audio is going to be something that's that's very interesting going forward uh, and i think it's just one of the ways in which you can build these more direct relationships over time rather than the sort of uh, infrequency or the um, superficiality quite often of, of something like social media. So just to recap sort of five key points, um, we really have seen extraordinary disruption of the media landscape over the last 10, 15 years. And the internet has done a number of things. It's kind of weakened the role of traditional gatekeepers such as mainstream media, but it's also kind of fragmented the way in which people get their news. And that has made it harder to, to tell the difference between something that's been through a checking process um, in uh, you know, journalism from just information that is published on the internet or between truth and lies in many cases. Uh, secondly, uh, coronavirus is just pushing things even faster. Uh, it's pushing us further towards digital. It is disrupting the business models of journalism much faster. And it's making it harder for many traditional media companies to survive financially. And that, you know, you may not worry too much about it, but actually it's important for democracy that there is, a, you know, a range of strong journalists who can hold rich and powerful people to account. Thirdly, uh, we are seeing, you know, increasingly the internet, which used to be, you know, this thing that, it was free, you could get any information, incredibly diverse views, anything goes. It's becoming uh, very different. You know, it, it's getting more regulated. Uh, a lot of quality content is going behind paywalls. So richer people get better quality information than people who can't afford it. Um, so it's going a long way from the original ideals. And I think people are really concerned about this notion of information inequality. Um, then there's information disorder. So, I mean, I think, you know, what we've seen in the US, this has been going on elsewhere for some time, but, you know, the, the US right in the home of Facebook and, and um, Twitter beginning to understand the potential impact on democracy and society. It's a real turning point. And I think, you know, we're going to see more regulation. It's going to be very messy and it's going to be very difficult in terms of where you draw the line. And then finally, um, you know, we really need to find ways to rebuild that trust. 
the media is looking to build direct relationship with consumers and re-establish that trust, re-establish that habit, but it's going to be really, really hard to do it given the kind of disruption that I've talked about. So hopefully I haven't depressed you too much um, and it'd uh, be really interesting to, to hear your, your thoughts. Uh, if you want to know any more information about the Institute, uh, you can go to the Royce Institute website or the Digital News Report website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Newman. Uh, that was a wonderful lecture. I have to say, I um, have been thinking about where I get my news from and I'm actually not too sure. Um, I, I, this really made me think like, where do I go in the morning first to, to find out what happened? And I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I'm going to have to pay closer attention, which, which apps yeah, I visit first. To write it down during the day yeah. and then say, is that where I want to be spending my time? Was that worthwhile? Exactly. Um, well, I hope that there's uh, some audience question now for the Q and A. Um, if you are on YouTube, um, feel free to just comment your question and I will read them out loud here. Um, and if you're here in the Zoom call, you can either um, text them into the chat. Again, I'll read them out loud or just raise your hand, unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, everything is fine. Um, I saw that we already have a question. Alicia, would you like to ask yourself or should I just read it out loud? Um, I think I'll just read the question. We have one question from Alicia. Um, she asked if there is a platform that you would recommend for unbiased news. Um, it depends whether you mean a platform or a, or a source of news. I mean, I think on the whole, um, you know, people have to make up their own decisions about what kind of media mix they want. But I think, you know, it's probably healthy to use a number of different sources. And, you know, some sources are good at just giving you the facts. Other sources are good at giving you sort of a diverse range of opinion. People have a range of, of needs audience needs around news. So obviously in an election or COVID-19, it's really about getting reliable information so you can, you know, manage your own risk mm -hmm. or find out about an election. That's kind of one need, but in other ways, you know, the media also helps you work out what you think about things or have a debate or be challenged by things. And I think part of the problem is that we've increasingly either we're favoring sources uh, that basically agree with us. And so we sort of get in this, this sort of loop where um, we're not really being challenged. And many newspapers have gone down this route as well in that they tend to employ columnists of similar types. In, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, there would be much more of a range within a single newspaper. Um, so it's much more on us actually to, to get the mix right and to be more literate about where you go for certain types of of news i think so i think it's not it's not one it's not one need it's not one platform it's not one brand uh it's trying to provide you know a range of different sources all right thank you very much um i hope that that um answered your question a little bit alicia um we have one more question sent here in the chat asked by uh balash um he asks, uh, what surprises me is the high degree of trust in the media in Turkey, given that Turkey is an authoritarian regime and media is under strict government control. What would be the explanation, uh, explanation for such a high degree of trust? Yeah, some of this requires interpretation, doesn't it? I mean, if, if, you, if you think about um, one of the countries with the highest level of trust in the world is China. And... Um, you know, some of that's genuinely people um, think the government's doing a good job or, um, but in other cases, maybe people don't feel that they're able to answer correctly in a, in, in a, in a survey. So there's a, there's a range of different things. I think in Turkey, I think it's a mixture of Erdogan is very popular with a certain group. And, um, uh, and so that's just a sort of, it's a partial thing in that particular case. It's not the fake news media because he controls a lot of the media. So it's about, you know, uh, trust in, in that political perspective. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's, it's, I, I think it, what we try and do mostly in the report is compare countries that are not authoritarian 
um, because it's much easier to, to, to make those trade-offs and it's harder to know what's going on uh, when people are answering that question in authoritarian places. Yes, thank you. Pleasure. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, another question by uh, Sebast Sebastian, um, who asks, uh, what about news in the form of online humor, um, which can be much more easily spread as videos, short stories, or memes um, than an article or newspaper blog? Yes. Um, well, I'd be interested to hear what you what you think about this as well. I think it's a really interesting subject. So um, we've obviously seen a lot of the content that is shared on social media. Some of it is sort of stuff that makes you angry and other stuff is stuff that makes you laugh, right? It's things that appeal to your emotions or you want to share with people. And so humor has worked really, really well in uh, social media. And I think it's, it's therefore something we're just seeing a lot more of. Now, of, often there's a barb to it. Sometimes it's satire. Uh, sometimes it's just um, uh, diverting us or a bit of fun, uh, like the Bernie Sanders uh, memes going around after the Biden inauguration. Uh, it's sometimes, you know, just a, a celebration of people's creativity, as in, as in that particular case. And it's definitely encouraged by different kinds of. Uh, devices and media, the fact that people can make their own content and share it is one of the reasons that, uh, you know, Instagram, Snapchat, um, TikTok increasingly are uh, are really emerging and news is increasingly part of that. Um, there is a tradition in the, in the US definitely around humor uh, with the late night talk shows and John Stewart and The Daily Show, which we don't really have in the in the UK. I think you have it in the Netherlands, don't you? There's some really funny um, sort of TV shows that mix news and humor. And it's again, it's really interesting to see some of those being picked up and working as part of it. So I think definitely news has broadened. You know, you wouldn't have I suppose you would have had cartoons in a newspaper. And in, in many ways, it's it's sort of taken that idea and making it more contemporary and um, bringing it out into a, a sort of more living multimedia form. But yeah, so, uh, tell, tell me, what do you think, Sebastian? What, what, what do you, um, do you use a lot of online humor? Do you enjoy online humor? Is that how you get your news? Well, I, yeah, I definitely think that there's, um, <laughs> I know that quite a lot of people get at least part of their news or part of their information feed, literally from some such as memes, or these pages that provide some very short satirical version of it, often very biased towards their political leanings. Right, exactly. There's often a political... Um, yeah. And it does kind of, you know, also tend to make people more extreme because at some point you're going to want more quality material with deeper information that, that really spiral you down some uh, weird lanes, both up and down in terms of left, right. Right. Um, I mean, I, I think... This is none of this is unhealthy in its own right, but if that's all you do, or it's squeezing out other things, that's where you get the problem. I mean, I think it's, you know, uh, I, I look at means, I, I enjoy them, and it's trying to balance it. Again, having that sort of appropriate news diet where you recognize, okay, that's a bit of a meme, but how am I going to challenge myself and see what's going on, on the other side? I mean, I found during the US elections, I was really trying to, because I was just getting all these liberal memes coming up, what was going on on the other side? You know, how were conservatives reacting to, to Biden's inauguration? And, you know, I could turn on some US TV channels and it's a completely different story going on there. I went to, to Parler to look at the memes that were being shared in Parler and they were, they were shocking, but completely different. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. Um, I see that uh, Christoph has his hand raised. Hi, yes, um, Christoph, journalist from Malta. Uh, thank you for your presentation. My question is about the so-called famous objectivity. Uh, we've just seen yesterday New York Times firing Lauren Wolf for supposedly her comments she made. Yep. The BBC recently updated their social media guidelines. Are news organizations putting too much emphasis on this so-called objectivity? Or is it just a perception and people don't really care so much about it? 
It's a great question, and we're doing a lot more work on that this year. Um, and we we sort of asked about this last year, and it's slightly different in different countries, but essentially in a lot of European countries, a lot of northern European countries with strong independent public media, there's this very strong tradition of impartiality. So the public service broadcaster has these rules about sort of equal balance and being fair to all sides. And that kind of worked really well when there was you know very few choices and so most people were were accessing these public broadcasters and so the public broadcast had a duty to represent most points of view now there's kind of an argument that when you can get news from anywhere you can get all these different views yourself you don't need uh, the same sort of impartiality and anyway journalists are all biased and you know they've all got their own political perceptions and the bbc is basically left full of left left leaning people so there's a huge argument about it right now and um and the bbc is sort of basically uh, it's also been threatened by social media because as you rightly say um it's a slightly you know journalists sort of let their hair down and they they, they let people know who they are a little bit more and New York Times, BBC has very strict guidelines, which says you can't comment on political events because it might affect the way your news reporting is perceived. So it might reduce this sort of sense of objectivity, which journalists aim for, even if it's not possible. And um, so, so that's kind of where we are. It's under a lot of pressure and it's under pressure from a lot of people who want more partial news so they can make money or push certain certain agendas and i think ultimately you know society has to decide what it wants does it want what happens in the us does it want people in these bubbles or does it want people to be informed and have the same common set of facts and so the bbc is saying we're going to double down on impartiality it's actually more important than ever and we actually asked um at the beginning of the year we asked um uh, 200 editors in chief and uh, from around the world, and 88% of them said that impartiality mattered more than ever because of what was going on. One little final footnote to it is young people are much less committed to impartiality. So when you ask them, do you want news with no point of view or news that shares your point of view, younger people are more likely to say they want news that shares your, their point of view. Why do you think that is? Um, hopefully, because my my biased opinion, because people are understanding that you can't just chase this objectivity. Like I just started my master's in journalism, and I would have sworn on a Bible that objectivity is the way to go. But I've literally done a 180, and I'm thinking you can't. You have to fight fire with fire. You can't have Donald Trump spewing all sorts of lies and treating his word like gospel. And I'm just using the Donald Trump cliche. We have um, uh, Belarus. We have Russia, yeah. we have all sorts of these problems and we can't be objective. You have to call a lie a lie. And if a politician is spewing lies one day, you can't consider him as credible the next right. press conference you're attending. I respect that view, but I, I don't necessarily agree with it. I think you can be impartial, but you can also um, uh, be clear about what where the evidence leads you. You know, you, you know you, I don't think it necessarily, the problem with calling calling people liars is that it basically makes, you know, you're pushing one half of the, the, the population into something more partial. Um, and you can still, you can still, you can still look at the evidence and say, you know, the, you can be impartial and say, there's no evidence that the election was stolen. And you can find lots of different ways of saying that it's not about providing equal balance to, you know, somebody who's lying and somebody who isn't lying. So I think the way in which we think about impartiality maybe needs to change and be clearer as journalists, but I don't think we should abandon it personally. Thank you very much. Um, we have a lot more questions here in the chat. So um, I just want to say I can read them out loud, but if you guys are comfortable with it, also feel free to just raise your hand and ask them yourself as Christoph did. That's always welcome, but uh, until then I'll, uh, read out the first question that we have, which is by uh, Stefan, Stefan Janssen. Um, he asks um, about social media as a um, main source of news, what exactly that entails. Um, he says, I can follow newspapers and journalists with varying degrees of trustworthiness on Facebook and Twitter, um, and sometimes even interact with them directly, um, or read wild, completely unsourced claims. Is this distinction addressed in the survey? 
Yeah, I mean, it is really complicated. Um, so I think we, we've sort of divided people up into people who say they only use social media for news, so they don't use print, they don't use online news sites, very small number of people. And then people who use social media and other forms of news, but social media is kind of secondary. And then for other people where they're spending a lot of their time on social media, what are they... What are they looking at? Uh, that's actually something we're looking at in more detail this year, where we've asked people, you know, where do you focus your attention? So when you're in social media and you, you say you're consuming news, are you looking at, you know, memes? Are you looking at celebrities talking about are you look, mainstream media? And broadly, the answer is um, people are paying attention when they think about news quite often to traditional media organizations or to journalists. That's a big part of it. Uh, politicians is part of it as well. So it's a range of voices, I think, um, and memes and, you know, all, all of these things. It's hard to get a handle on. And that's why we try and sort of ask people questions in a survey, but we also talk to them in focus groups and things like that to get a more rounded picture of what actually that means. All right. Thank you, um, Stefan. Uh, I hope that this explains it a little bit better. Um, the next question is by Thais. Um, she asks, why do you think, or yeah, why do you think that podcasts are favored over news? Um, to me, it seems like there is equal danger of unbiased news or information in both, as well as the other sources of news mentioned in the presentation. For instance, various news outlets have their own podcasts. Um, yeah, we haven't really seen much misinformation in podcasts. I'm not quite sure why. Um, yeah, maybe there's a bit more sort of, uh, it's harder to, one of the things is that there is no sort of algorithm really behind podcasts that means that the more outrageous you are, the more people who listen or who get exposed to it, like there is in social media. So it's more about quality and personal recommendation about whether it's good. So I think that's, you know, I think that's one reason why podcasts will be less affected. You do have a lot of increasingly now a lot of um, uh, in places like the States, you know, right wing talk shows or extreme and left wing talk shows have been part of radio for many years. And many of them are now podcasts and some of them are very popular. Um, so you, you do get a sort of interesting range of opinion through podcasts as well, but it hasn't been affected as much as some others. It, it, it may happen. And actually the ones that people are listening to the most are, you know, the New York Times, the Guardian, a lot of these sort of more traditional news organizations that yes, they have a point of view, but it's not, it's not sort of extreme. Um, or it, it mostly in, in the podcast, it's really trying to be objective. What's interesting actually is one of the reasons they've done so well is that they're not, many of the ones that have done well are really not about um, talking about politics in a traditional way. It's much more about explaining the news, answering listeners' questions, and you know that sense of community that I think some podcasts have. And I think a lot of, it, it's actually making the sort of journalism that has worked on television or radio, the sort of adversarial approach, really doesn't work in podcasts. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you very much. That is very interesting. Um, I think um, a lot of us, or at least a lot of people I've talked to really do enjoy podcasts because it gives such a broad variety of uh, just different opinions on topics, just people right. talking, explaining more. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we ask people why they use podcasts and as you say, diverse views. So it feels more diverse than than listening to radio, for example. There's more people like you, but also more challenging stuff. So, you know, actually it, it goes against what I was saying earlier in terms of younger people looking for more of the same. Actually, we're looking for serendipity. We're looking for progress and for learning stuff. And podcast is very much seen as part of that, which is one of the reasons it really appeals to under 35s. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question is by uh, Miriam. She asks, um, what's your take on social media sites taking a bit more responsibility for the content that is being shared on them? Is that a trend we will see growing? And is it a good way to deal with mis or disinformation? I think it's one way to deal with it. I mean, I think, yes, they need to take more responsibility, but what lies, what lies behind that? So what do we actually want them to do? Do we want them to ban politicians uh, do we want them to uh yeah take stuff down do we want them to 
to promote better sources of news? Do we want them to encourage fact checking? I mean, what is it that we really mean when we say that we want them to take responsibility? Um, maybe we want to take stuff down, but if it's something we like, then we don't like that anymore. So I personally think that society uh, needs to be much clearer about it, what, what it wants social media to do. And part of the problem is we can't agree on that. Politicians basically have no vested interest in doing this because they really like being able to use social media to talk directly to people. Uh, so, the, you know, it's just really hard to get agreement. And it's just much easier to kick social media companies and say, you're the bad guys. Whereas we saw in the presentation, actually people think that politicians are, are the biggest problem when it comes to misinformation. Yeah, thank you. May I have a question? Sure. Uh, what kind of role does law have in this uh, question or in this situation? Uh, do you think it can be solved by using legal means or legal tools such as uh, laws, acts of parliament or court decisions? Um, it, it's uh, something that has to be solved uh, by politicians and within the field of politics. I think... Um... Yeah, no, I, th I, th I think um, there will be uh, there will be legislations and then and then the court, you know, ultimately may have to decide things beyond that. But that's what we're seeing all over the world is is laws around um, false information um, being expressed on the Internet. The Internet broadly was unregulated was um, and it's becoming regulated. And over the next 10 years, it will become subject to many of the laws that we um, that publishers are, are responsible for elsewhere. And that will be, um, I think that's kind of inevitable, but I think as with say newspapers, we don't want sort of formal regulation of the, of these things because um, it's, we don't necessarily want politicians to interfere in what we can, uh, what we can say and what we can't say or powerful people to interfere with that. So it's a very delicate balance really but what yeah. i meant was who is to decide whether uh, what uh, what is acceptable in a democratic society in terms of free speech and where is where the borderline is between uh, violations of right to uh, free speech and uh, for example hate speech these are very thin lines they are uh, and it's it's an incredibly good question and i don't have a really good answer for you and that's what everyone is is basically trying to work out now in some countries the politicians have basically come up with answers you know in in conjunction with legal experts they've drawn up new legislation about where they think the line should be and what the fine should be for anyone transgressing that uh, and introduced legislation and this is happening in many many countries um, and then you know we need to see how that is being implemented and you know we'll take a view on on whether it's it's working or it isn't working. Personally, do you think uh, it should be the state uh, giving these uh, regulations and legislations, or should it be like more like the U.S. model of uh, self-regulatory instruments of these social media websites? I think it's uh, you know with with issues like free speech, I think that self-regulation, if it can work, is with you know agreed guidelines you know so most of the newspapers in most western countries for example have agreements about accuracy fairness uh, and they kind of abide by them and they have rules by which you can complain about those things and i think that's that tends to be a better thing than sort of politicians or the state weighing in if it's possible what we're seeing is that you know these social platforms have these rules already but the consequences are for society of what's going on are considered not good enough. And so the state is trying to take further action against it. Um, and I think there will, you know, it's a very difficult thing because there will probably be unforeseen consequences of taking that kind of action. Yeah. And uh, the problem is that also self-regulation is not really democratic. So uh, self-regulation self basically means that it's up to the social media platform to decide what's acceptable and what's not. And many people think that this should be done by democratically elected officials or politicians. 
depends who you trust. Do you trust those politicians to do that and to say how the regulation should work? If you, you know, if you live in an authoritarian state, you probably don't trust those politicians to do that. And th so th this is the eternal, <laughs> the eternal problem of uh, of where you draw the line and and what rules you follow. Uh, but well, it's going to be a big theme over the next uh, couple of years, I think. Yeah, well, that's a tough question. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Um, Balash, you also had a question in the chat earlier, I think maybe as a follow-up to a previous question. About... Yes, it was a follow-up to a previous question about uh, being unbiased. And uh, my question was that uh, uh, does uh, mm, complete... Uh, mm, does complete unbiasedness exist? And uh, uh, do we expect journalists to be completely unbiased and just always seek the truth? Or do we accept that journalists are indeed people and when they uh, report on events, they, they just uh, automatically uh, write their reports in a way that it reflects their personal uh, worldviews and preferences? I mean, I think to me, impartiality is about trying to overcome our biases. So I think we all have biases. And um, the point of impartial journalism is a set of procedures and checks that you go through when you're reporting something to ask yourself and to be edited by other people to try and get as close as you can to the truth while recognizing that there is going to be bias in everyone and in organizations. And so, you know, I think there's a slight misunderstanding of impartiality. It's not saying that, you know, we're not biased because we are all biased. It's how do you, what procedures do you take to overcome those biases? And that's what the sort of journalistic processes are, are, are really about, is how you can get closer to the truth, how you can, can uh, ask the right questions before you publish something um, to make it as fair as possible. Yes, so impartiality, impartiality doesn't really apply to uh, the individual journalists. It more, it more like applies to the whole uh, system in which journalism operates. So, yeah, it's not saying that an individual journalist doesn't have biases or can't vote for a particular. You know, all of those things are true. But when you're reporting a story, you try and put those aside, and the training you've been through and the checks of your editor try and get as close to that as possible. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, I think we have time for one last question. Um, there is a question asked by Einars. Uh, if he wants to ask it himself, feel free to. Yeah, sure. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I just want to also say thank you for the lecture. I think it's been marvelous and uh, very interesting as well, the debates afterwards. Um, and it's a bit of a long one, but kind of I was looking at the factors of radicalization and one of them being the lack of representation that people feel um, coming from politics, uh, politics or as well mainstream media. And I'm thinking with the continued um, as well as stronger after the 6th of January capital riots blocking of certain contents on social media, would it contribute to more radicalization or is it in the long term a good way to work on solving um, this issue as well kind of a follow-up to that is what could be a different approach could more open opinion pieces or debates in media contribute to people feeling represented as well as information being critically assessed which is another part of um, radicalization that people are just getting one um, sort of information that really then um, positives their own um, bias or their own uh, views yeah, I mean, they're, they're really great questions. And I think the, you know, the issue of, of how representative is your media system is a really interesting one. And I think it has contributed to what we've seen in the US. So, you know, people complain about the liberal media and in the work that we've done, we can see that there is a liberal media, that the people on the right have not been very well represented. So with the exception of Fox News, if you look at the top news organizations, almost all of the others have a, um, uh, a more liberal bias. And I'm not really talking about the output, but in terms of the proportion of people who are using those mainstream outlets tend to be more from the left than from the right. So for people on the right, this is one of the reasons why Rupert Murdoch 
you know, pushed Fox News to be more on the right because he saw a massive gap of underrepresentativeness. He saw basically a lot of liberal journalists representing people on the left, but not necessarily people on the right. And so that's why you've you've recently seen, uh, you know, more representation um, with those those, and also um, that's why you know social media and and the right has been such a, a big thing as well. Um, in you know in other countries, we've also seen uh, the media has been specifically targeted for being too left wing, too liberal, and not representing people on the right. In Germany, for example, or in Sweden. And uh, as a result, they have, in many cases, because of the internet, they've set up their own media um, to be able to represent those views as well. So, you know, there's a fine balance between, you know, how far should the public media, uh, for example, talk about controversial issues like immigration, and if they don't represent or uh, reflect the debates that people are having, will there then be uh, media that becomes more extreme and leads to these bubbles. So uh, these are, you know, these are unanswerable questions, but they're, 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 they're things that people are, are extremely worried about. And if you close down Donald Trump's accounts, uh, then there is a danger that people are going to go to right wing social networks in the US or uh, to private networks. And we won't, and, and what they're saying will be even less uh, transparent for people to follow and to see what their plans are. So I think there is um, definitely concern that, uh, you know, so, so the question you ask at the end is a really good one. You know, how do you engage people so that they don't feel that they do feel properly represented? How do we have debates that are inclusive and that deal with the big issues, but in ways that don't push people into separate. And I think that is a huge challenge right now for journalism. It's one of the central challenges. I don't have any great answers, but I think, yeah, de uh, debates, engaging people, you know, putting aside some of the language that people are using both um, politicians, but also in the media as well, which has become incredibly polarized. It, you know, it's really hard to have those debates right now. And it's leading to some of those problems of representation. Thank you. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for uh, your talk, Mr. Newman. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, I, for one, can say that I'll definitely try to pay some more attention about where I actually do get my information from um, and maybe consider actually subscribing or, or looking at specific news sources rather than just randomly finding it on the internet. Um, though I'm not sure whether that's better or worse. Uh, depends, I think. But anyways, thank you very much for coming. Um, we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much. Um, for a couple of announcements uh, for any uh, non-SIP members that are here, um, we have a lecture every Monday. So feel free to come and check it out on Facebook um, when the upcoming ones are posted and just come join us on Mondays to see um, to see more interesting lectures coming up. Um, and if you want, feel free to stick around a bit longer tonight uh, for some conversations or discussions. Um, but apart from that, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Um, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. <laughs>